Ali ono što je bitno, taj prvi susret s crkvom, da te boje budu radosne, da se ne plašimo tih lijepih, jarkih boja i da ne idemo na to da je tamo nešto crno, strašno, mračno, nego da je svjetlo i lijepo. Manche bezeichnen unsere Kirche als Diaspora-Kirche. Sie ist aber auch als heimische Kirche zu betrachten, da viele unserer Gläubigen in Deutschland seit langem leben. Mehrere Generationen von ihnen sind sogar hier geboren. Welcome to the uh, conference, New Young People, Migration and the Demographic uh, Challenge in the uh, Western Balkans, respectively, to our panel, The Role of the Diaspora and Regional Relation, the second panel of the day, and if I'm not mistaken, the last regular panel of this uh, conference. Um, a panel which I would like to give a subtitle uh, called Influence Beyond Remittances, question mark because this is an issue that, that I would like to ask some, some questions about. Um, let me briefly introduce you the five uh, panelists. For the sake of simplicity, I will do it in alphabetical order. And I'll do it really brief, because if you're interested in more extensive uh, CVs, you can find them on the uh, conference website. Uh, we are connected to Adem Gashi, who works at the West Balkan Youth Project. Uh, which is attached to the Regional um, Cooperation Council in Sarajevo. Uh, then we will be talking to Nikola Kandic, lawyer and project um, assistant, also based in uh, Sarajevo, if I'm not mistaken. He is with the Youth Council of the Federation of Bosnia and Herzegovina. And uh, then we have Lumni Yusufi, who joins us from Berlin, I suppose. Uh, all right. Um, she is a linguist and researcher at the Department of Slavic and Hungarian Studies at the Humboldt University in Berlin, but she has also worked with various universities in Southeast Europe or with the Technical University in Dortmund and the Ludwig Maximilians University in uh, Munich. Uh, from Skopje, we are joined by uh, Silvana Moisovska, who is professor at the Interna for, for International Economics at the Kirille Methodius University in Skopje. And then there is, uh, there is Nermin Oroch with us, um, who is founder and director of the Center for Development, Evaluation and Social Science Research in Sarajevo. So we have a three-fifth majority for Sarajevo in our panel and coordinator of the Western Balkans Migration Network. Let me just briefly tell you what we are planning for just in case I prepared three rounds of, of questions for everybody, which of course I might adapt according to how our debate goes. But actually I'm only planning right now to ask the first set of questions and then we would like to immediately open the floor to the others, other people who might have joined and hopefully joined us uh, via uh, Zoom so that you can ask your questions. 
uh, and only if no questions or not enough questions would be coming up, I would go with the second and third round of my own questions. A technical remark for the questions, uh, use either the Q&A function or this raise hand function. Uh, Mrs. Ash has uh, promised to help me a little bit with the moderation. I have been like all of us in a lot of uh, Zoom conferences uh, since March this year, either as a panelist or as uh, listener, but not yet as a moderator. So I hope I'm not going to mix it up as obviously I managed already in the very first minute of this panel, but I hope I'm not going to make any other technical uh, mistakes here. And uh, okay, I went uh, introducing you um, uh, in the order of the, of the alphabet. Now I would like to go the other way around and start with uh, Nermin Oroch, founder and director, as I said, of this uh, uh, Center for Development, Evaluation, and Social, Social Science and Research in Sarajevo. Um, and you, you provided this conference with a very comprehensive and interesting paper, which of course I've read in preparation for this moderation. And there is one issue that I found particularly, I mean, there are many issues which I found interesting, but one which I really would like to, to, to ask you about, to, to share more details with this. You state in your paper that um, I'm quoting, there is evidence of a difference in political views in the results of elections when votes in the diaspora are compared to the votes of the local populations in the country. Um, you also urge, if I understood you correctly, a simplification of voting process and attracting diaspora members to get involved in elections. And you propose reserving seats um, in the respective parliaments for diaspora members uh, which, as you write, could be an effective way to increase the interest in participation of diaspora voters at elections in their home countries or countries of origin. Um, now, the question I have is, when you look at the voting patterns of diasporas, very often there are more, of course there are exceptions, but often there are more nationalists than the voting patterns of people in the respective countries. I wanted to give three examples. At the, elect at the Turkish pre presidential elections in 2018, Erdogan ended up with about 52 point something percent, whereas the uh, diaspora in Germany voted 67%, I think. Well, let me see, I, I have the 65% for him. So had it, up, had it been up only to the uh, diaspora, and the same patterns you can, could observe in Austria, Belgium, and other countries in Western Europe. So had it been only up to the diaspora, the undemocratic regime of Tayyip Erdogan would have been even stronger than, uh, uh, than, than without them. Uh, second example, um, uh, Mrs. Moskowska, please, uh, um, uh, Moskowska, please um, correct me if I'm wrong, but if I'm not mistaken, uh, in Macedonia, it was Prime Minister Gruevski and his uh, national, uh, nationalist Vimro party who introduced three reserved seats for the diaspora because they figured that uh, they would be winning them for their line of policy, which I think in 2011 uh, also happened. And the last example, I remember a discussion with Serjan Bogusavljevic, one of the smartest political analysts, I think at least in Serbia, who uh, told me some years ago about the uh, radical nationalistic uh, uh, Serbian diaspora in uh, Australia running full-fledged newspaper ads for the reoccupation of Kosovo and, and so on, to which he said, well, listen, why don't they send their kids to war in Kosovo and let us um, mind our own business here in Serbia? I just do not want to have them say in, uh, in our politics. I gave these examples because I wanted to prepare a question, which is, do you really believe, do you, what makes you believe that uh, involving the diaspora, reserving seats for them in parliaments where it hasn't happened yet anyhow, would really be, um, would really have a beneficial influence on the domestic political landscape? Uh, well, this uh, argument about the large involvement of uh, diaspora, can you hear me? Uh, yes, I, I like off and on, uh, go on and then I will please go on talking. Yeah, okay. Uh, so the, uh, the argument presented uh, 
uh, with regards to the larger uh, political involvement of diaspora is uh, part of the say, larger framework which was presented in the paper that uh, political involvement will also contribute to um, say improved cooperation uh, regionally and improved cooperation between uh, diaspora and their home societies and thus contribute to the development of these countries. Uh, specifically, uh, the arguments about, uh, say, expected um, uh, con say, uh, role of the diaspora in, say, democratization or, you know, changes of political regimes even, uh, is based on evidence such as a uh, paper by Tena Prelitz about uh, uh, voting behavior of uh, Serbian diaspora uh, in presidential election to 2017, and also on the say following the patterns of um, say uh, emigration of people uh, from these countries, uh, mainly, uh, and this can be say uh, contrasting uh, behavior or you know uh, contra contrast to uh, uh, Turkish diaspora. In a, a vast majority, I would say, uh, of the diaspora currently are uh, what we call outsiders. Uh, you refer to, let's say, you know, labor market uh, 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 behavior or access. Uh, these people are usually the ones that are uh, not well integrated into these political establishments. Uh, uh, are not part of the say uh, uh, regime and control over uh, state resources, and thus as such they are usually, uh, as we can see from the evidence, the ones that are best and brightest, brightest, but not really having an opportunity to actually uh, say uh, uh, succeed uh, within their country. So they are somehow driven outside the country very often supported by these uh, political establishments that see this as an opportunity to say, get rid of opposition uh, and also expect some remittances influence in the future. And I was referring to some examples where we have you know, bilateral uh, employment programs with Germany in a situation where we are already lacking such a labor force. Uh, this say, can be an evidence of uh, uh, say the, interests or motivation of the current political regimes. Uh, when we talk about, uh, say, nationalistic uh, behavior or feelings of uh, diaspora community, I would still say that uh, it may be because uh, nationalists are louder, uh, are more present in these, I don't know, communications or media or, uh, but uh, if we look at a composition of diaspora, which is changing. Uh, we still, I think we still have some prejudices towards diaspora based on, say, uh, their involvement in 1990s. But then uh, at a later stage, you know, evidence I mentioned, uh, you know, some, uh, from Serbia, some evidence mentioned in the elections in Albania and Kosovo suggest that we actually have a uh, different uh, kind of, uh, you know, behavior and influence or, or political views of this diaspora community and uh, also uh, the uh, recommendation for uh, involving diaspora through uh, parliamentary seats uh, is uh, something that is already uh, being mentioned in Kosovo, for example. So there are some initiatives not yet materialized, but uh, already initiatives for that. Uh, and I think this is uh, the reason why it didn't happen yet uh, compared to, for example, you know, Croatian parliament having seats for, you know, Croats from uh, Bosnia, you know, expecting or, or uh, being quite aware of, you know, which party will gain majority of votes from, uh, from these uh, voters. I think the reluctance of local governments to include these people, um, you know, in parliaments or more, uh, uh, str more strongly in the political lives, I don't know, even through, you know, easier uh, voting procedures such as electronic voting is because uh, they, there is uh, expectation or there is a feeling of threat by this uh, diaspora community because they know there is increasing number uh, due to recent uh, immigration flows uh, of people who would vote against current political regimes.
Okay, thank you very much. And don't get me wrong, I didn't say to the, I didn't want to say that your your assessment was wrong. I just had the impression when I went through it that it might be that it might have a lot of facets. And of course, you're right. In the Serbian case, which you mentioned in your study, that's like a counterexample. You have another counterexample. I would dare to say in Romania, where the diaspora was very uh, very uh, important in the protests against Livio Dragnea. Uh, but then again, I, I think there are other examples, so that deserves maybe a separate conference uh, uh, for separate studies, or maybe they are, and I'm just not aware of them. Thank you very much um, for the first round, but maybe we can get back to this um, in the uh, second. Um, and now, because I'm going backwards in the alphabet, uh, I have a question for Sirvana Moisovska, whom I cannot see right now in my uh wait in my computer here but i guess she's there yes i see you now hello, hello. Uh, you also uh contributed a comprehensive study uh for this conference which of course i also uh read and also a lot of uh, interesting inspiration in this paper in the paper among other things you advocate uh increasing the mobility of professionals in the western balkans through mutual recognition of professional qualifications, I'm quoting again, and by removing obstacles to the mobility of students, researchers, and academics, this approach, you write, could promote intra-regional migration. Now, I think why there's no, while there's no person in his or her right mind who would be against promoting intra-regional uh, migration and reducing obstacles, uh, such as uh, recognizing diplomas. We all know this is an ever never ending issue between Kosovo and Serbia, for example, uh, but also in other countries. I was just wondering, um, would this really make other indications that this, this could actually make a substantial difference in, in the sense that, like why would people from one country where people are leaving from in masses move to another country where people are leaving uh, I mean, for academics, I, I believe especially would be great if there would be more interaction and movement, but then again, academics and journalists, for example, are, are irre irrelevant in terms of, of numbers on the GDP influence. Would this really make um, a difference? I realize, of course, that this was only one of the ideas you proposed, but what kind of difference do you think could it make? It could make a difference that uh, it will... Uh encourage so-called circular migration because it's easier for people to come back from the countries in the region and that became very visible now with the situation of COVID. So for anyone that was close in the countries nearby, it was easy to come here. Uh, the idea here is actually related to SEFTA as there is a process of recognition of uh, professional uh, qualifications within SEFTA. And, uh, but so far nothing has been done actually because the processes are really complicated. And anyone who went through a process of recognition of a diploma, let's say in uh, North Macedonia from uh, Serbia, it's a very complicated procedure. And then it's, it's a paradox, but it's easier to go and work in uh, Germany, for example, than to get a job in the region. And if we are talking about staying in the region, then we have to think about that. But here, uh, although I put it as an idea, I must say there is also uh, one uh, threat that we must be aware of. This uh, professional uh, recognition of qualification, mutual recognition of uh, professional qualification has been advocated within uh, SEFTA and as part of regional cooperation. Uh, and it is uh, very much encouraged by the European Union. But on the other hand, uh, no one has opened the question uh, how to relate that to the process of EU integration. Because many people were eager to go to Croatia because it was closer to the European Union. And when it entered the European Union, many questions remained open like, okay, no, so now what with these people that are from these uh, Balkan countries? So uh, this could help people to uh, remain in the region, the professionals, but also uh, these questions need to be open. We could not see the regional cooperation a part of the EU integration. And mm -hmm. we must admit EU integration is far more appealing for the people than the regional integration. <laughs> mm -hmm. 
May I add one question here? I mean, you mentioned it's incredible, it's incredible complicated to get like from to move from northern Macedonia to Serbia and get one's uh, um, uh, uh, one's papers uh, recognized. Uh, can you maybe, if you know more about it, tell a little bit, why is it so complicated? Are the governments aware of it? And why are they not doing anything about it if they are aware of it? I think they're aware of it because they uh, are the ones who stipulate the procedures, how to make the notification of a certain diploma. And Balkan countries are not, uh, they don't have a preferential treatment or something. So what is uh, applicable for, let's say, a diploma gained in uh, Austria or uh, any other country is applicable also for the Balkans, no matter that the systems were, were quite uh, similar before. So the procedures themselves are quite, are quite complicated. And that doesn't mean that people could not get jobs, because for many jobs, especially in the private sector, you, you don't need a diploma or uh, you also don't need a rec um, notificated diploma of, to work in the international organizations. But if you want to uh, get uh, an employment at the universities, not as a visiting uh, professor, but as a uh, full-time uh, staff, then you have to go through all these procedures. And that's why uh, very often people tend to avoid these procedures and they, they just go abroad, where in some countries it is easier to do this. So Jen, just one last question for this first round. Are there any statistics to your knowledge that um, tell us something about the existing movement, which in spite of all uh, obstacles exists from people moving from one Balkan, Western Balkan country to the other uh, for jobs? No. Unfortunately, that's, uh, there are some very limited statistics, but the question of statistics is uh, one of the more, most painful questions with regards to the migration. Uh, in uh, our countries, in the Western Balkans, unfortunately, we don't know uh, how many people uh, have left the countries. And it is uh, a paradox to rely on the statistics of the receiving countries. And uh, there are many reasons for that. And one I have mentioned in, in my paper that that should also be done, because if you don't have statistics, especially... Uh, these countries also have issues with their censuses. In my country, we didn't have census for 20 years. How we could know uh, uh, who, has who has left the country, who has remained in the country, and what skills these people uh, have. Uh, the, the, the ones that are uh, left the country, uh, that contributes to melting of the human capital of the country. And uh, if we don't know who has remained, we could not have any proper economic planning. So statistics is definitely a major issue. And if uh, we should prioritize what to do first, I think these countries uh, definitely should tackle the statistics. Thank you very much. This is very interesting. I refrain now from another question that's on the tip of my tongue on uh, North Macedonia and censuses and statistics, but we might come back to that in the second round and we can okay. ask the same question, I think, about Bosnia, even though they had a census a while ago, but about the political implications. Thank you very much. Uh, and the next on my list is Lumia Yusufi. Now, again, for whatever reason, I cannot see her because probably I'm not. Aha, uh -huh, now I can. Um, and uh, who also has contributed a study or a research paper um, to this uh, uh, to this conference, even having interviews with more than 120 uh, people uh, for this paper. Uh, you, do, you have done a lot of research in German uh, and, and English on the relations between people who emigrated and those who stayed. Uh, actually, I learned from your uh, paper a lot of the uh, um, stereotypes on both sides, among them that the word diasporashi is a swear word in Bosnia, which I, which I hadn't heard before. Um, and you also write about the um, well-educated descendants of migrants who might think, think, who might be thinking of coming back, but they have like, uh, they, they often struggle with exclusion and with networks to which they do not belong and which do not accept them, especially as I understand, and I've read that in other research papers as well, in the field of academics. 
Could you maybe elaborate a little bit about the situation of those potential returnees and the obstacles they find in the countries they return to or they are contemplating returning to? Um, the first step, it's uh, this what, what uh, Silvana said, um, to recognize the diploma. It's really very, very long time and very difficult process. The second one, um, I would say, are the advertisements uh, for new jobs, because often um, I can observe that um, they are formal criteria like to have the residence in the country at the time of the application or to have the, the, the citizenship um, of the country on the work. So it's a, it's a catch-22 situation in a way. Yes, I think you have no chance to applicate and not to get the job. Um, and I, I, I see it really every day because I'm, I'm Albanologist and I'm, I work with Kosovo, Macedonia, North Macedonia and Albania uh, a lot. And you can see also in the contact with the institution, not really with the colleagues. It's very difficult for me as, um, as a worker from university, okay, not really a professor with my students, because we have students for Slavic studies, for Albanian studies, and to, to, to send somebody with a name, with a Slavic name or with Albanian name there is very, very diff difficult for summer schools, for internship and also on. Only with Erasmus, it's, it's gone because Erasmus we had it now in Berlin, but before also in Munich. Uh, all the other, um, my students, um, they excluded my students because of the name, really. And they say it's not for Albanians. Mean? It's not for Albanians, for example, in Pristina, a semi very famous international seminar. It's only for foreign people. And mm -hmm. when I ask, where can you see the, this Albanian? What is Albanian for you? The Albanian name. It doesn't matter if this student it is born and grew up in Germany and can speak the Albanian language, but it, it, it studied now and have to, to learn it good, uh, have to learn it well and say, no, they are Albanians. It doesn't matter the passport. It doesn't matter the language uh, knowledges and, and so on. It's really very, very difficult for me as a German institution to work with the institution on Western Balkans and to mm -hmm. have this changing with students from here, from Germany to there, from there to here, it's better. Do you also know something? I mean, now you describe the academic sphere, which obviously uh, is the sphere you know best because you belong to it. Do you also know something about, let's say, um, the, the, the so-called real economy? Are there also networks uh, of, of, of people that, that maybe work together to exclude potential returnees? Are there any studies or do you know anything about it? Um, I just finished a study with a colleague uh, of my from Max Planck Institute, and we work a lot with returnees, really returnees uh, for, in Kosovo. And it's for them, it's it's difficult too. They said all of them uh, we we have some informants, and all of them were returnees from Germany um, after. <sighs> not after the war, they were former refugees here and went back in 2008 after the independence of Kosovo and says that the locals, the locals before, um, called them Shatsa. It's this, uh, this straight war for, for emigrants, not for emigrants. And they say they called us Shatsa and all of them studied now German language and work with the German language and wanted to come to Germany again because they are integrated there, they work there and say it's very, very difficult in the everyday li life to, to have a normal communication with people. In, maybe they hear an accent from them because they, they grew up in Germany and want as a teenager there and 
didn't want, uh, didn't learn really Albanian language because they, there were anything uh, for these children in Kosovo um, integrated program because they said it's a repatriation um, in, in the country, are Albanians and we don't need some special classes or uh, uh, language courses and so on. And it's, I think, Yes, it's it's a very it's it's difficult to say what are locals and what what are emigrated people because I think in Kosovo most mostly or maybe all of them has migration experience in the past because of the war, and it's a very very conflictful um, relationship. In Kosovo, is worse um, than in other um, Western Balkan states. I can hear you, Mr. Martin. Because the, I saw, I got the message the, uh, that the operator muted me because probably we had church bells in the background. This was not meant to be now, but that's how it happens sometimes. Um, all right, thank you very much. Uh, and then I am going on to uh, Nicola uh, Kandic. Um, sorry, I have to, yes, now I can see you, hi. Um, you work with young people a lot and you belong to them uh, by the generation also. Could you maybe on a, not now on an expert level, but on a general level, explain a little bit, um, I mean, we read a lot about in, in those studies mentioned before, or generally in studies on migration about how the reasons to leave your country have changed. I mean, in the case of Bosnia, obviously they have changed because it's not the war anymore uh, uh, driving people out, but also how people do not, like how, how there's a difference between the Gastarbeiteri in the, in the 60s and 70s who, 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 who left for work, and now people who are not necessarily only uh, leaving for because of, 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 uh, of a career and, and, and prospects and with a better job, but because they believe they would not like to live in a society which, as they perceive it, does not judge them by their merits, but by their connections or the right party membership or whatever. Um, can you maybe, if this is the case, I mean, if, if, if not, be free to, to tell me that it's not, but if it is, could you elaborate a little bit about what young people, what, what is the trigger for young people uh, to, to, to contemplate leaving? Uh, and have there been any shifts in the latest years maybe? Oh, uh, thank you on the question. Do you hear me? Yes, I hear you perfectly. Oh, uh, great. Uh, well, uh, as you said, I work with uh, young people uh, every day and we have uh, a lot of different stories and a lot of different answers. What are the main reasons uh, for young people to uh, leave uh, their countries from the Western Balkan six? Uh, at the first place, uh, that is a question of uh, unemployment and uh, the reason for their their leaving countries are finding job, but that that's not the only reason. Uh, in the last few years, there are uh, other reasons like uh, people in Western Balkan six countries don't believe in the system, in political system in their countries. They believe that the level of corruption is a high, not only the uh, level of corruption in the governments, but also in uh, educational system, in the healthcare system. And uh, we can say that today, uh, young people in the Western Balkans don't feel safe. Not uh, that they uh, don't feel safe that someone will kill them, but they don't feel safe at, at any aspect of life. If you are going to university, you are not sure that you will get uh, uh, enough uh, knowledge. Or if you are going to hospitals, you are not sure uh, that you will uh, get uh, the right uh, health care or something like that. But what is important for us, like uh, youngsters for Western Balkan six countries, is to talk about uh, diaspora because we see diaspora like a bridge uh, between our countries and uh, diaspora in other countries abroad. Uh, we really believe that we uh, can use uh, the knowledge uh, of diaspora as a tool is in some processes. Uh, probably the main um, the main issue for the Western Balkan six uh, countries is the issue of economy. And we really believe that uh, diaspora need to be included in, um, this, uh, in this region um, in the way uh, like diaspora direct investments. And uh, we really believe uh, that uh, uh, 
our governments need to make a better economic environment for diaspora because uh, why someone who is from Bosnia and Herzegovina and now lives in Germany and have enough money to invest in uh, Bosnia and Herzegovina will invest in Bosnia and Herzegovina if economic environment is not good. That's probably one of the ways how we need to improve situation in the Western Balkan 6 and uh, to be uh, to become mm, uh, better uh, better economies. Also what is important for us yes uh, uh, is uh, to have some strategic plan or uh, some uh, really good uh, survey about structure of diaspora. Uh, today we are speaking about diaspora like uh, about rich people in Germany in o and Austria, but maybe that's not uh, the case in every, in, in, in every case. Uh, what is happening with our diaspora who is uh, not rich in Germany or in, in Sweden? Uh, and uh, today is a problem also that we don't know the numbers uh, of the people who live abroad and who are the part of our diaspora. And also the question uh, pro uh, question about uh, from Professor Moisowska about uh, migration between Western Balkan countries. For example, I'm born in Montenegro in 1992 and I live more than 25 years in Bosnia Herzegovina. If you ask anyone from the Western Balkans, is Nikola diaspora? He's not diaspora because he lives in a country which is similar to uh, the homeland, uh, the language is similar, situation is similar. But imagine Nikola who is born in 1992 in uh, Montenegro and he lives only 10 years in Germany. Is that Nikola diaspora? That Nikola is probably diaspora for the Western Balkan countries. And that's uh, something uh, which we need to research because we don't have uh, enough, uh, uh, po uh, enough uh, information about a structure of our diaspora. Uh, that is important for us because at the moment we have the information about them, then we can create uh, policies at the uh, state level, because this uh, process is uh, really important for us if we want to include diaspora policies in our development policies in the future. Thank you very much. And because I see we do not have so many questions yet, uh, I will allow myself to, to make an exception from my own rule and ask a second question, if I may, uh, that popped up to me in me while I was listening to you. I'm constantly, as a journalist, looking for positive stories from the Balkans. And actually, I think if you look for them, you can find them. Um, and one of them, I, one, one thing that really impressed me in Bosnia, and since you lived there for so many years, you, you will have heard of it, is the uh, Nias Hastero Foundation um, and the stuff they do. Uh, Nias Hastero, for those who do not know, is a, a real big name. Well, now we, th we have to see whether he still will be because he, in the automotive industry, he has a conglomerate of, uh, of companies who are working with Volkswagen, Mercedes, BMW, whatever. He is a real hidden champion on world level. Um, unfortunately, he is in, in a certain trouble now because he is in a fight with, with Volkswagen. We cannot go into all these details, but I went to Borazda and had a look at their factories and I was really, really impressed uh, to me being a dilettante here. Of course, this would look really like state of the art production. And then I had a look at the Hastro Foundation, which basically was doing what is lacking so often in the region. Uh, they were educating the people they need for their, for their companies. Uh, they were giving scholarships to, to families in need so that they do not have to leave in order to finish their educational career. They have this dual approach of education and training on the job. And uh, I don't know, I was really impressed and I was wondering, wow, why don't we have more of these initiatives? Would you agree that this is like a way to go? And for example, I mean, I don't want to reclame uh, Hastro here, but that, that, that this kind of approach is, a, is, is a helpful? Yeah, uh, of course, uh, uh, that that kind of approach is really helpful. And that's not only a great example in the Western Balkan countries. There's a lot of uh, different uh, councils of the our diaspora groups in other parts of countries which are helping our students uh, with scholarships and something like that. But what is important, that are individual cases we need to have reforms in the, our countries because uh, that reforms need to be from the top to the bottom. 
if uh, Mr. Hartzor or someone like uh, him uh, wanna invest in Bosnia and Herzegovina, he need to be sure that that money will be uh, will be in Bosnia and Herzegovina and will be spent on the right way. Uh, that's the reason why we need refor uh, reforms, uh, because in the societies like uh, Bosnia and Herzegovina and all other Western Bar Balkan countries, as I said, one of the biggest problem is corruption. Corruption, uh, because we don't believe in our uh, educational system, in our political system, in our judicial system. And that's the reason why we need these reforms before uh, we uh, ask diaspora to invest money. After that, we can uh, think about that, that uh, we need transfer of the knowledge from the university uh, professors and acad academics from the Western uh, world, or maybe uh, we also uh, can uh, ask diaspora to invest money and to invest that money in universities, in charities, in uh, companies, uh, in any other way. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much. I think we'll get back to this if I have the time to the question of, of what has to be done to uh, make uh, the countries of the Western Balkans more attractive to post potential investors from the uh, diaspora. Uh, but now uh, I want to close the first round with the question to Adam Gashi. Hello. Um, I hope you can hear me. No? Yes, yes, okay. Mr. Martins. Yes, hi, hi, hi. We're connected. Sorry for, sorry for having kept you waiting so much, but it was a very interesting first round. Um, well, something I I think we should ask it, I don't think it's in the papers yet because they obviously were researched and written uh, quite a while ago, but that we should that we should um, include, and it was partly mentioned, of course, already in yesterday's uh, panels, for example, the one that Tim Judah moderated, uh, what influence has COVID-19 on the entire question of migration, circular migration, and so on? We heard yesterday in the panel, I forgot who said it, that the remittances in Bulgaria went down by, I think, by figures of the National Bank in Sofia by 65% or something. So obviously, I mean, this, for all of us, we wouldn't be sitting here staring at, at, computer, uh, at computers if it wasn't for COVID-19. We would be seeing each other, hopefully, in Berlin and in, or in another nice place. This has had a huge impact on everyday life. How, how, how has it impacted, to your knowledge, migration, migration plans of, of uh, young people? What, what do you know and hear about that? So, uh, yeah, it's a challenge. I mean, when being like the last one in the conference uh, to add something valuable <laughs> in the sense of... You, you can also decide to ignore my question and answer another question, which you find more important, but maybe you can just with one or two sentences go on. Oh, it's... Uh, but nevertheless, I mean, it's uh, the part, the part I mean, of the region in, uh, in uh, this aspect, it is the part of the brain gain has not been actually addressed yet uh, in, in the sense of... of uh, be it uh, specifically in the economies or the uh, the region as a whole. In the sense of the economies, uh, it's still, I mean, the migration issue has been swept under the rug, I believe, in, in, this, uh, in this part, and the discussions have not been opened and and uh, thoroughly addressed uh, the, the key uh, push and pull factors uh, that are uh, that are affecting all the economies in the region. And uh, maybe I'm going to jump uh, quite quick to the conclusion, uh, but uh, it is the part that we see and the, the, the experience that we have. It is if we don't deal with this issue regional uh, at the regional level, I mean, also with diaspora and with different re issues that concern, if we don't deal with, at the regional level, uh, then uh, next year we don't have uh, to uh, convene another conference on youth and diaspora and uh, the region at uh, this level or any other level because the problems are going to be the same. We're going to be discussing all about the same issues. And uh, luckily, I mean, uh, we had uh, the opportunity, as I said, uh, it's a blessing sometimes to be like on, uh, on, on the end, uh, as you may hear, like from innovative and bright minds about different uh, activities, different actions, different researches that they have done. And it was mentioned also what diaspora is serving to the region. On one side, we were talking about a very qualified diaspora, and as well as talking about the issue of lack of the of the uh, data about the diaspora. 
and at the same time, what do they bring uh, to, to the region when they come or how they are received in the region? And of course, if the region is not going to provide this platform, this area that is going to go beyond the, uh, the, the old problems that it has, uh, economies between each other, as well as uh, lack of cooperation between each other in, in different sense, be it on mobility of the citizens, be it on the educational level of exchange uh, programs, or be it on the cooperation of the youth, uh, let's say in this regard, then uh, when the diaspora comes, as you were saying, like maybe it's going to be limited the contribution to the part of the remittances. Uh, but uh, is it going to help uh, the, the region? Does the region have the capacity to absorb the contribution of diaspora that it, it entails or whether it has the opportunity to uh, conduct the exchanges with the with the uh, other part of the world through the diaspora or within the region uh, to 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 uh, to utilize all the resources that it has, this all depends about the regional cooperation that it enhances. Uh, for instance, like only on the project that we have with the Western Balkan Youth Lab project, it seeks uh, to have uh, to establish cooperation between the youth councils in the region with youth councils in uh, European uh, Union member states. And so in this regard, uh, just thinking about this process and uh, making it to very tangible uh, uh, results and tangible cooperation level uh, uh, in, in the sense of uh, more, uh, more uh, standardized and structured cooperation with the EU and with other countries and with diaspora, this could be uh, the, some of the platforms that actually could be utilized better in the sense of, uh, in the sense of having the contribution of diaspora as well as of engaging the circular uh, migration. Because if the brain gain is addressed and in, in, uh, uh, investment opportunities are provided in the region, then of course uh, diaspora and all this uh, circular migration will be much smoother and much uh, much uh, productive in uh, different senses rather than as uh, one of the first issues was raised here like do they bring more nationalism to the balkans if we are offering nationalism of course they are going to bring nationalism if we are offering cooperation and uh, and innovation uh, space and uh, opportunity space, then they're gonna uh, be contributing to this part in 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 uh, that sense. Okay. Maybe they'll bring both nationalism and money that goes together very often. But anyhow, uh, we we can go on this in a second round maybe. Uh, thank you very much for this first round. Uh, now I would like to ask Mrs. Ash. I'm just afraid if I push a button, I'll kick my out, uh, kick myself out of this panel again. I see. I think there are three questions. Mrs. Ash, would you like to? Could you read them out? I think that's what we agreed. Yes, of course. Thank you. Um, Thank you. There is no question, though. There is just a comment that, that I believe refers to the beginning of the panel. Uh, it says both the Serbian and Albanian diaspora vote far more progressively than their counterparts in the Balkans. This is just a fact that can be seen by the share of the anti-Vucic and anti-PDK votes among the diaspora. Calling them nationalistic is very anachronistic and a deep mischaracterization of their political culture. So well, maybe this is a topic yes, that, whoever, that... Whoever said that probably didn't listen so carefully because they, they, I, I didn't claim that this is always the case. I just claim there is it's, it's a broad picture. I think one could add to Albania and Serbia, which we have mentioned also, I mean to Kosovo and Serbia, also Romania, where, as I said before, Livno Dragnia, who is a so-called socialist, but of course not in, in substance, uh, was um, was ousted uh, partly or mainly due also to uh, or due to a strong involvement of the diaspora. But then again, we have counterexamples uh, as from Turkey, uh, which is of course not Western Balkan, but belongs to the region, region and uh, Macedonia. So I guess the picture is definitely not uh, clear cut in any case. Okay, so if there's only one uh, comment and no question, I would uh, go with a second round of question then, if that's okay. Uh, now, again, and I would then again just keep the old order uh, 
and try to go back to Nermin Oroch, who, who is still uh, with us. And actually, that's it's perfect because what I wrote down for the second round exactly fits to how the first round ended. And this is about methods of attracting uh, diaspora um, uh, diaspora, uh, uh, to, I mean, investments and so on. You write in your, I think you, I, have, I hope I'm not mixing up the, the studies which I read now, but uh, you're writing, correct me if that was not you, that the diaspora should be the main target of government, government efforts to attract foreign investments. Mm -hmm. Diaspora investors are not facing obstacles, on a different line you write, diaspora investors are not facing obstacles for starting their business in the Western Balkan countries any differently from other investors. But if that is the case, why then a special focus on diaspora instead of focusing first and foremost on reducing red tape, corruption, bureaucracy, nepotism, whatever? Wouldn't that be the first? And then the second is only to develop special programs for diaspora? Uh, yeah, I think these are not actually uh, conflicting statements to try to explain. This is based on uh, two projects I was involved in. Uh, one was implemented by Swiss Development Agency and the other one uh, implemented by USAID. Uh, we're uh, matching grants we are provided to the diaspora investors. And uh, surveys uh, of their needs, of their preferences uh, uh, was conducted and basically uh, in order to uh, address the main obstacles for uh, investment, uh, they found out that basically uh, when we talk about uh, say the first set of obstacles, uh, it's about uh, business climate, business environment. And this is something that say, if we are going to attract uh, diaspora investments, we are actually tackling the, the, the issues for any other investors. So uh, I mean that they are facing the same obstacles in terms of the you know administrative procedures and such things. What I was uh, uh, the other thing that I mentioned that uh, you know there is there are strong reasons for uh, focusing say uh, investment promotion activities. You know I think all countries have something like you know foreign investment promotion agency, and uh, you know although we you know internally you know, sometimes as a joke call them, you know, foreign investment prevention agencies. Um, the issue is that, you know, when you, when you talk to these or, you know, when you see their activities, you, you don't see a recognition that uh, there is a strong diaspora, there, is, there are diaspora investors and the diaspora investors have uh, this, you know, a patriotic motive and have patriotic rent, you know, are willing to take, you know, even, uh, say larger risk or you know lower returns to their investments because they have uh, they want to contribute to their local communities. Uh, examples you mentioned uh, from Goraj that I'm also quite familiar. So I have a lot of family members there. Uh, is that uh, compared to 2010 when UNDP conducted a regional assessment study uh, in Bosnia, uh, uh, ranking municipalities by their development. Gorazda was at the bottom of the list. The same study in 2015, Gorazda was at the top of the list. Uh, and this is like, you know, development index with, you know, indicators on unemployment, you know, GDP, wages, do you, and such things. Do you, do you think Hastor made, made a difference? Was exactly, Hastor and Bekto, the other investor from yeah, Austria. Yeah. So basically two investors uh, have made a considerable change in the well-being of a local community, but both and of them, both investors are actually people of, uh, you know, uh, uh, born in Gorazde. So they are not investors, you know, inv let's say looking for investment, investment opportunities anywhere in Bosnia. They are actually investing in their local community. Uh, the other thing I would like to raise here is that uh, the issue of sustainability. Uh, so what would happen if these people were leave? And this is what e exactly what they were, they were threatening. Uh, local government, they said, you know, whatever success they made was not thanks to these local governments, but despite their efforts, you know, to make environment even worse for them. And uh, these, uh, the, the, the owners actually participated in uh, protests, in, uh, you know, well-known ones in 2014 in Bosnia. So, uh, so there is obviously a lot of room to actually improve cooperation 
between diaspora investors and uh, you know governments, including local level governments, which you know according to the evidence we have, is not really a cooperation, but uh, rather let's say disconnected efforts, and maybe you know um, cases, let's say you know even. Again, if, yeah. if, I, if I may add, uh, because the, I, I really find the example of Gorashtir really, really important because it shows it can work. When I was there, I interviewed the local mayor, whose name I forgot, who actually, I had the impression from both sides, meaning the investors and the local mayor, that on local level, the prob there was not a big problem. It was more on entity level and on higher level. On local level, of course, the, the, the mayor was happy that all of a sudden, you know, he had this God given, so to speak, development and and uh, he he had jobs to provide not only for Gorashtir people came from Serbia uh, yes, to work yes, there yes. Uh, they were picking them up with buses actually there was the problem which is also mentioned in some of the papers that that they had a lack of, of working force but then on entity level or state level in the question of the the um, highway and so on that that was that was really a problem and then really it was uh, interesting how one of the biggest taxpayers can act actually not be heard by uh, by by on entity level uh, or or state level uh, with his uh, projects. I would like to interrupt this uh, uh, second round for a second because we have I saw one comment which I would just like to add, and we have also one question. The comment is by Tim Judah, who said, "Don't forget that also Maria Sando in Moldova was highly uh, over the average supported by the di diaspora." So we have another example here about let's say progressive influence. Of the diaspora, diaspora, the more I hear about it, the pros and cons or the different examples, I think this could be a topic for a separate conference, the political voting patterns and political influence of the uh, diasporas. Uh, and we have a question I see by Anissa Shuka, who had just, Anila Shuka, who had just been gone for a while. Can the moderators give, put her up somehow? No. Ah, we have two questions. Okay, could you, could you, I don't know how this is being done. Could you please let them speak? Let them ask their questions. You have to unmute yourselves. We have to? Anila, you have to unmute yourself. <coughs> okay, thank you, sorry. Just my, hello to everybody, thank you very much. So, we are speaking here now for the people who should uh, come back uh, to West, Western Balkan. And uh, this is the first step to be done by the government in the region uh, to create the condition. Uh, this is okay. But um, I am a mother of a, a seven years uh, old German Albanian daughter who speaks Albanian with German accent, like her shots, maybe, I don't know. And uh, she, um, and the question is uh, if it uh, uh, would, would make sense for the German government, so the European government and uh, the European Union to support the diaspora children as well and the youth, uh, uh, the young, uh, younger generation to know better their origin countries with summer camps, exchanges, and maybe with courses of the ori origin languages uh, in uh, their countries where they live. Uh, because I remember in the time of Yugoslavia, this was uh, well organized and maybe this is something to be done uh, like a contract. Thank you. Okay, so this was more a, a comment I understand than a question or would anyone like to react on what has been, been said? Then please make yourself known. No, okay, but okay. we do have, yeah, Sorry. please, please, please go ahead. Yes, um, it, it is a very, very big conflict for a long time in Germany, this um, old rule for la um, uh, language courses um, for migrants in Germany, because this program was for, for children of gastarbeiter, guest worker, to prepare them <laughs> for going back, that was the program or the idea of Gastarbeiter. And after the wars in 19, uh, 1990 in Yugoslavia, the German institution or the German Bundesländer, um, the part, Republic of what is in English, decide to don't to 
to stop this program because they say we want, we don't want to prepare these children for going back because it's also, also the curricula of these classes. It was really not really good for integrating the children here in Germany. And if Germany pay these courses, it had to be in other concept of language courses and the state of origins, some, uh, mostly of them on the Western Balkans, didn't want to offer a new concept um, for languages, not as a mother tongue, but as a foreign language. There was a very big in initiative in Kosovo and Albania together for the Albanian language. And the concept was the same like in Yugoslavia. They wanted to, um, um, to, to give it abroad the same concept of language and national concept and I don't know what and history uh, from the country, from Albania and Kosovo, but, but not a new one with this um, idea for bilingual children, uh, Albanian as a foreign language. It's not the same like in Yugoslavia time. Thank you very much. Uh, and we have another question from Nelia Aivazi. You must please unmute yourself, uh, otherwise we cannot hear you. Are you still there? No, I guess not. So then we will return to our round of uh, questions. Um, to the second round. All right. Um, so um, I would like to now ask Silvana Morsovska again about the um, the instruments. Uh, you mentioned SEFTA, the instruments to in, to make it more, I mean, to enhance or to make uh, investments from diaspora, from people from the diaspora more attractive. Could you, uh, what instruments are there and what should, what instruments should be there or what is not working properly about the existing instruments? Because obviously um, there is a lot, there's a lot to become, there's a lot to be improved. Could you, um, could you elaborate on that a little bit? Yeah, uh, what I was referring to is actually the existing instrument within the frame of uh, so-called regional economic area, which is called RIRA, the Regional Investment uh, Agenda. And uh, I was commenting on that because it was developed uh, within the frame of uh, uh, strengthening the regional cooperation but actually, I would say without doing a proper uh, uh, sector diagnostic or uh, uh, what actually countries like and what is the, uh, is, uh, the potential they have. Because uh, this process has been uh, done under the umbrella of the European Union within uh, the scope of so-called regional cooperation. And that is the part the countries have signed in the uh, Trieste Forum and uh, as a pledge, a political pledge that they will uh, devote to that. On the other hand, we have uh, the Western Balkan countries seeing themselves as rivals in attracting foreign direct investments. They all uh, depend on the foreign direct investments. So, uh, here, we don't have, according to me, clear connection between both processes. So one of the proposals that I make in the paper is actually to put this RIRA into a realistic concept. How to do that? By actually making a proper study for the whole region, how, uh, in what fields we can attract uh, foreign invest investors, and to build so-called uh, regional supply chains. These chains do not exist. Uh, I would argue uh, on this idea that we could not force foreign companies where to invest, and we could not force the diaspora to, co to come and invest in certain sectors, but we could do that into making a proper strategy, what actually could work? What is the potential in terms of skills and qualifications in the region? What work, works perfectly in the past few years, in, I think in all the countries of the Western Balkans, are investment in IT. IT industries are blooming. 
but that is a service oriented industry. Now we are talking about production. And there is a reason why things are uh, developing like this, because in all Oops. Um, of uh, investment, the countries were actually doing their best. Uh, they were not focusing themselves on the region, they were focusing themselves on the Balkans, on, on the European Union market. So when you have a focus on the European Union market and you have free access, then it's very difficult actually to look yourself within the region. And that has to be changed. There are initiatives like this one that I've mentioned, the uh, uh, RIRA and SEFTA and so on, but they need to get a policy content in order to make them work. Thank you very much. I lost you. I don't know whether it was only my connection for, for like half a minute or something, uh, but I got most of it. Uh, I, I'm tempted to ask about the textile industry and ship a question, but uh, I, will, I will go. I mean, maybe we can do that in, a, in another round if we, well, actually, we have to do it at another occasion, I'm afraid. Um, Mrs. Yusufi, one question that, that popped up when I read your study. Um, what do you think, having been an emigrant and contemplating returning to one's home to be politically active, from your research, would that be more a liability or an asset in the view of the respective communities to which people might return? Political sphere? I'm sorry, like, I couldn't uh, understand your question. Okay, like, like, I mean, you're an immigrant from, I don't know, Macedonia, Albanian from, from Tetovo. You have been abroad 10 years somewhere and you, you, you acquired some knowledge, some skills, whatever, and you decide to return in order to be political, politically active. And you describe in your research how there are stereotypes on both sides, how you know the people who stayed perceive those who left as arrogant and how those who left perceive those who stayed as backward and whatever. So if you return, can you, I mean, maybe it's not possible to generalize, but I wanted to ask anyhow, do you, what, if, if someone returns and wants to be politically active in the community that he or maybe even his parents or her parents once came from, would the fact that he or she has been abroad make him more or less attractive as a political actor to the, to the people he tries to appeal to? I think no, <laughs> because um, the critic for the emigrants are always, if, if, we are, if we want to discuss about the political situation there, everybody says, and not really colleagues, but also in the family, they say, oh, you don't know how is it here. You have to live here, I don't know, a couple of years and to pay your tax and to, to look for a job and to send your children in this very crazy school, crazy school, sorry, um, and to go to the hospital with one doctors and also one. It's really very, very difficult. We have at the beginning of our discussion, this problem with the votes and with the political opinion of diaspora. I think the diaspora is politically a really a very big vacuum because they can't vote in the state of the residence. They have to vote in the state of origin and they have to be updated in both countries in the state of the origin and the state of residence. And I think it's really very difficult. And because of this vacuum and sorry, it's very difficult to vote abroad because of this vacuum and because of this very big challenge, there is a very big chance and potential to influence the, um, the migrants. I see here in Germany that the migrants um, don't make a difference uh, between the different parties. They vote them who is very active, who organized the travel, who came here and speaks with them and said, how can we help you? It doesn't come later helps, but it's this concept. And I think that it's also the success of Erdogan because Erdogan is in Germany very, very active. We have really a very big vacuum. I think if everybody is so active like, like Erdogan in, in abroad or in Germany, 
I think we will have a very different vote situation from migrants. And Thank in the political much. sphere is very, very, very difficult. It's um, difficult in the state of origin when I'm discussed with my family about vote, for mm -hmm. me, crazy vote and say, you can't imagine how is it here and you can't discuss with us. Thank you very much. And now I see there is an intervention from, from Adam Gashi and then we have another uh, uh, intervention. Uh, yes, please go ahead, Adam. Yeah, sure. I mean, just uh, regarding the regional uh, economic area in uh, in the Balkans, that the RCC, I mean, works heavily on this agenda, and it's uh, very ambitious, actually. And uh, in the process of the common regional market for 2021-2024, there have been extensive consultations, and there is also a big commitment from the countries in the, from the economies in the region, actually to uh, deliver concrete results on uh, different aspects uh, that are covered through this uh, through this plan. And as well as, I mean, uh, there have been also in the sense of, of the previous, uh, previous uh, uh, achievements in the sense of the digitalization and the other aspects in the regional cooperation. Uh, we may mention just the roaming uh, tariffs that have been reduced, and uh, that is, I mean, of the uh, of this this kind of contribution. I mean, that has been very tangible for uh, through these uh, kind of actions. Uh, so, and uh, then in this regard, just to mention, I mean, that uh, we have to keep an eye on on the other intervention that uh, it's from the European Union that comes. Uh, through the uh, economic and investment plan for the Western Balkans, that it is going to be the 9 billion injection in the economies of the Western Balkans, that it is uh, also one opportunity to, to look forward to and to, to, uh, to uh, maybe complement the local uh, or, uh, or the, the regional initiatives that, uh, that are on this way. So just wanted to, in the sense of Ms. Moisovska's uh, response and uh, contribution in this aspect. Thank you very much. I realize it's really much easier to uh, moderate a real life discussion uh, because I am having now more questions and interventions. Uh, there is, uh, uh, we, have a, we have a question from, or comment from Blerta Begisholi, uh, who, yeah, she, uh, for, for a comment, please, could you? Could you make yourself heard and understood? Unmute yourself, please. Uh, can you all hear me? Yeah. Okay, perfect. Um, so I had a comment in relation to, to your questions and the, the, about the, how, how active and busy it is for, for, for youth of the Western Balkans who have studied. Hello? Oh, damn it. Hello? People for a long time, I was back in Kosovo, politically active. So I think I, I have some experience on that. And the main difference is the, the political parties. Um, we have some political parties who are um, very much looking forward to attract uh, young talents who have studied abroad, who have experience abroad. And you have the ones who still live with this old mindset who are um, maybe as part of their discourse use this idea of attracting foreign, foreign uh, social capital and foreign students coming back, but actually do not implement that. And if you, as a young person, try to go back, it will be a really hostile environment in a way which... Um, will not welcome you in the way you expected it. So I think it really much depends from the Kosovo um, example. It depends from the political party. Would you, would you be willing to say which parties are more welcoming and which might only, you know, pretend to be welcoming for immigrants? <laughs> you don't have to. You don't uh, have to. <laughs> I, I, I might try to give a more um, general um, answer. I have the impression that the, um, the parties that belong to the right wing, the, the parties of the after the war parties, as we call them in Kosovo, 
are less open for for foreign um, um, for foreign young force, whereas the social democratic ones are or the ones on the left are more open. You were careful not to mention names, but I think everyone uh, knows which parties you meant. Thank you very much. <laughs> for your, Thank you. For your intervention. Okay, so um, now I wrote down so much that I'm getting confused by my own handwriting. Aha, yes. Um, something I wanted to ask uh, Nikola Kandic, uh, and I'm trying to find him now here on my screen. Hi. Um, now, we, we keep hearing for years, and there is this great research by Tim Judah and others about, you know, how in certain sectors, especially healthcare, um, you know, there's more and more, um, there are more and more shortages. Uh, actually, having been a hospital patient in Belgrade myself some years ago, uh, I, I experienced this firsthand uh, as well. Um, what... But can you, I mean, have you in your daily life experienced, for example, let's stay in the health business, let's be concrete, in the healthcare, uh, in the healthcare sector, have you experiences or do you know firsthand accounts of people who actually run into trouble because their health system was understaffed? Be it in Sarajevo, be it because I think there is even more extreme uh, somewhere in, 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 in smaller towns or even villages. Is this happening? Is this an experience that people know about? I mean, that many people experience. Uh, well, uh, we have paradox in, in this uh, in this situation. Uh, I'm I now live in Sarajevo, but I'm from one small town at the south of country, and uh, in that small uh, town. Uh, uh, at this moment, maybe we have only 30% of the necessary medical workers in the hospital. And yeah, but, but you mean the town in Montenegro where you come? You, you're from yeah, I, okay. I, I'm born in Montenegro. After that, I'm raised at the south of the country and now I, I live in Sarajevo. That's, that's okay. all migration, but okay. not to the Western world, just uh, inside mm -hmm. Western Balkans. Mm -hmm. uh, well, and we have that uh, situation, but uh, there is one paradox. At the, we still have uh, the medical workers who are unemployed in Bosnia and Herzegovina. And that's something what is uh, not easy to explain how that's uh, happening in Bosnia, uh, in Bosnia and Herzegovina. And um, maybe I like to use that uh, word system and systematical uh, measures, but uh, all these problems we have today are part of the systematical measures and uh, uh, our country have different uh, agreement with Western uh, European countries uh, about uh, medical uh, workers, especially with Germany and not only Bosnia and Herzegovina, also Serbia and other uh, countries in the Western Balkan Six. But what you uh, what is a problem when you live in Sarajevo today? is uh, because uh, in this moment, the narrative about medical system is really bad. Maybe the, the, what, have... the narrative? narrative about mm -hmm. our health care system and medical system is really bad. Maybe we still have uh, enough uh, uh, good uh, medical workers in our hospitals, but the whole narrative is that everyone who is a good doctor, he is now in Germany. Uh, in Bosnia and Herzegovina, we now believe that doctors which work in our hospitals are not good enough. If you mm -hmm. are good enough, you are probably in Germany. If you are in Bosnia and Herzegovina, that means that you have fake diploma because we have a problem with that or that you are not good enough. And that's wow. something what we need to change. Not only this situation that we have uh, less medical workers in Bosnia and Herzegovina and the Western Balkan countries, but also this narrative about the quality of the people who work now in Bosnia and Herzegovina, not only in the healthcare uh, system, but also in other systems. If, if you are a un uh, university professor at the faculty of law, for example, and you're a professor at Vienna, you're a good one. But if you are a professor at University of uh, Skopje, like a professor at the uh, University of Economics, you are not good enough because you are in the Western Balkans. And that's something that we need really to change. How, I mean, this is an awful narrative, obviously, but how would you change that narrative? Oh, well, how to change that narrative is uh, maybe to inform uh, the uh, audience, uh, 
population about bright uh, stories, about these stories from Guarajda, because uh, if you live in Bosnia Herzegovina, that doesn't mean that you know about the story uh, of Guarajda. Maybe uh, journalists from Austria know about Guarajda, but not every uh, person in Bosnia Herzegovina, and that's really a problem. Do you Yes, I was surprised. I mean, I found Goras really a great story, and I said this Nias Hastur should be a superstar in Bosnia. I mean, he's known, but not so many people have ever, you know, can imagine that you have Goras full of you know, huge factories who are really competing on top world level. So yeah, true. More more of those stories. I completely, I completely uh, agree. Thank you very much. Uh, uh, Nervin Oroc, yes. Um, you you have the you and Adam Gashi now have the possibility for a closing statement if you want to because we have like eight minutes left so not so much. Um, if you summarize like on a to do list, um, what should be done to change narratives and then indirectly reality? What would what what would top your to do list? Am I the first to start? Uh, yes, please. Okay. Yeah, well, if we would uh, say try to summarize, uh, you know, all the arguments presented, for example, about the the need to increase involvement of diaspora, not necessarily through uh, you know financial contribution, but also through skills transfers. Uh, if we uh, talk about uh, you know the issue of this uh, you know internal political party networks and so on. And if we talk about you know the need for further research to understand what is the what are the characteristics of the diaspora, their needs, and so on, uh, I would argue. I mean, if I'm allowed to you know give some proposals, uh, especially for the ones where um, you know countries like Germany, you know, or other EU, EU countries can contribute to, uh, I would say uh, something like. Um, you know, a, a regional, you know, Western Balkans university uh, established by EU fund that would attract people from abroad, people of, you know, uh, Western Balkans diaspora to get involved, uh, you know, as researcher, as research fellow, as, as professors, uh, which would improve education system, obviously, in these countries, which would attract diaspora uh, uh, in countries that uh, are not, where universities are not necessarily open uh, to this. Uh, this would be, I think, you know, proposal uh, on the top of my list. I may be a bit biased, you know, as an academic, but it seems to me, you know, when we when we hear all these stories, um, this seems like, you know, a no-brainer. I would say. Yes, you want to comment? I like the idea. Uh, uh, European Union-funded regional the, Western Balkans yeah. University is seated in where? The, in Sarajevo, of course. <laughs> okay. okay. Well, no doubt on this panel with three fifth majority for Sarajevo, that would be the that would be the result. And we stay in Sarajevo for the for the last uh, question to to Adam Gashi. And I would also ask you to somehow summarize your your plan for the Western for tackling the Western Balkan migration crisis. So, as I said from the beginning on, if we don't tackle this issue from the regional perspective, I mean, we are going to continue to discuss on these matters again and again. And I like very much, I mean, the idea of uh, Nermin that was mentioning that there should be initiatives uh, that uh, address uh, the part, I mean, th he mentioned through education, but there could be also EPA funds that could be allocated to uh, tackle this uh, part of the diaspora and contribution relation with the Western Balkan uh, economies uh, in uh, this regard. And what uh, we are gonna, uh, what we will be doing, it's the part that uh, even as, as a project that we are with a youth uh, led project that we work in, it's uh, to try to uh, make, uh, to make the youth uh, uh, to increase their participation in decision making in order for these uh, uh, all these uh, conditions that exist uh, legal infrastructural uh, market uh, uh, environment and everything to uh, be uh, to correspond with the needs that are for those that are going to be affected by that uh, so in this regard not just to be consulted about these policies, but actually to be involved in designing the uh, 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 the solutions and everything in order to feel the ownership 
in uh, both designing the solutions, but also implementing policies related to all these conditions that are making them leave uh, the, the region, but as well as to make the region a favorable environment for the diaspora to come in. And besides the old talks and all old, uh, old discussions to have a much more elevated level of contribution and exchange uh, in, in both sides. So this is from my side. Thanks a lot again. Thank you very much. Mentioning HIPAA funds reminded me of a study. I don't know the title, but it will be easy to Google, which, which I found interesting. Uh, it's by the European Stability Initiative, one of the best think tanks I think we have in Europe. Uh, and they proposed a while ago uh, as one measure, um, treating Western Balkan states financially, at least as if they were already members and making structural funds available uh, to them instead of the EPA funds. Of course, uh, on the notion of strict political uh, conditionality, I found that a very interesting uh, idea, even though, of course, there is a question of how politically realistic it is. But then again, that is nothing uh, we can discuss today. Thank you very much. I, uh, for all of you, I still find a real life conference much, much more fruitful than what we did today, but this is the best we can do right now. And at least I felt, I learned a lot and uh, thank you for your contributions. Um, now I am told that I should not close the conference, but uh, tell the co-moderator Valeska Esch, hi, that, yeah, to, to give over the floor to her, which I do right now. Thank you very much, bye-bye. Thank you very much, Mr. Martins, and I couldn't agree more. We would obviously have loved to host all of you here in Berlin these days. Um, we will continue in just one minute with some of our experts and partners who will briefly share their key takeaways uh, from the past two days and also with concluding remarks by Ambassador Schutz. Uh, we will continue in two minutes, so please stay tuned until then. Thank you.